Tonight, I will tell you, barring some unforeseen incident, we will finish the fifth chapter of John, which is a, always a high water mark. When we get to the end of a chapter, it's worth a celebration. Um, we won't have one, but it's worth one. We get to the end of John 5, and uh, we'll get ready to stay in 6 for a long time, because it's a biggie, and we'll talk about it before the night's over. Um, this is uh, our title's Moses the Accuser, and th that's a little odd to the ear because that's not a Bible phrase. We don't see the Bible call give him that title, but you're going to see in our opening text that Jesus does very much give him that title without actually calling him Moses the Accuser. Let's read our text. John 5:43. A little bit of this is a bleed over from last week. I want to try to lay the context, set you up for this last phrase. I'm come in my Father's name, and you don't receive me. If another would come in his own name, him you will receive, and boy, do they ever. Because over the course of the next generation, prior to the fall of the temple in AD 70, many people will come in their own name. The book of Acts records this over and over, that people come claiming to be somebody, and they, get, they garner large followings. Jesus' prophecy comes to pass. How can you believe which receive honor one of another, but you don't seek the honor that comes from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. And here's where we derive the title. So kind of go down this thought process with Jesus for a moment to grab this title. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. And that's why I title this Moses the Accuser, because Jesus says... Don't think I'm coming to do this. I'm not going to sit in the seat of judgment against you. You don't need me to sit in the seat of judgment because whether you realize it or not, you already have someone sitting in the seat of judgment against you. It's Moses. And so Moses takes on the role of accuser in whom you trust, 46 and 7. For had you believed Moses, there, here's a setup text that's going to, we'll have to pull back into the Old Testament to help complete had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how are you going to believe my words? And then this closes what has been a pretty deep, thick, widespread, lots of stuff happening chapter. I mean, we, everything from the man at the pool of Bethesda all the way up through introducing Jesus as resurrection. That's out of the blue. And then you close down with this bizarre statement that, by the way, doesn't appear in any other gospel. Matthew, Mark, and Luke never touch this. They don't touch this idea that Moses was an accuser to Israel, an accuser to the high priests, an accuser to the Pharisees. How might this be? Remember what Jesus says, you had, had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me, which is an interesting phrase because no, you didn't miss it. You've read Genesis through Deuteronomy your whole life. There's no moment in there when he says there's a guy named Jesus coming. So you didn't miss that. So where might this have been in, the, in that Mosaic writing. Maybe this. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up unto you a prophet from the midst of you, of your brethren, like me. Unto him you shall hearken. And like me, is the, the, the speaker is Moses. So Moses says, God's going to raise up a man from among you. That's a Jewish man from among you. He's going to be one of your brethren, but he will be a prophet. Skip down to the 18th verse. Same story. I will raise them up. This is God talking. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like you and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I shall command him. And this is happening a bit in reverse. It's sort of like saying, hey, here's what's going to happen to you guys. The Lord told me what's going to happen to you guys. So in the first verse, verse 15, it's Moses saying, there's going to be a prophet that's going to be raised up in your midst. The 18th verse, it's him telling him, them that the Lord has told him. And so you have this double testimony in the 18th chapter of Deuteronomy that God's going to raise someone up in the life and in midst of Israel, the Jewish brethren, who will be a prophet. That leads us to this statement. Moses is an accuser in two ways. I wanted to make sure that we stay true to the context, but that we also stay true to the spirit of the Old and the New Testament. Context, he prophesied of a prophet. They miss it because they're looking for a militant Messiah. Let's stay on that for just a second. We just read that from Deuteronomy. What did Moses say? There's a man coming from your brethren out of your midst who's going to be like me. He's going to be a prophet. What does a prophet do? A prophet represents God to people. 
Remember our, our opposite definitions? Prophets represent God to people. Priests represent people to God. <laughs> so if you, needed a, you need a priest because you need someone to mediate in front of a God you can't talk to, that's why you went to a priest, because he could talk to God. You needed a prophet to hear from a God you can't hear from. So God sends prophets and priests. This is why in the New Testament, you get to prophesy because you get to speak to people from God. You got to build them up. Remember that. That's New Testament prophecy. You got to build people up. You also get to be a priest. The Bible says he raised up a kingdom of priests, which means you get to represent yourself to God. You don't have to be represented by your pastor, your best friend, your spouse, whoever you get to be a priest. I don't, I don't, I still don't. I've never really got that. I was about to say, I don't think we get it. Forget it. I don't get it. I have never really swallowed the fact that the greatest thing that I have as a child of God is that I get to be a priest and go to God on my own behalf. I think we just take it for granted. You, you have that amazing ability to be able to talk to the father and you don't have to go through anybody to do it. And so he prophesied that there was going to be a prophet. Jesus comes as a prophet, meaning he represents God to people. Hebrews says he's a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, meaning he represents people to God. So in the twofold ministry of Jesus, he comes showing you what God looks like. Hey guys, here's my father. And then in his post-resurrection, he goes, hey father, here's my guys. <laughs> For the lack of, you, you understand what I mean? So it's, it's like prior to the cross, Hello, people. Here's what dad looks like. That's me as prophet. Post-resurrection. Hello, dad. Here's what they look like. That's Jesus as priest. Why don't they get it? Well, maybe they don't get it because, first of all, they're looking for a militant Messiah. If you keep looking for a guy to swing a sword and kill Caesar, you're going to miss the guy out there trying to introduce you to the love of the Father. And we're a little bit that way now in the church. And I, I don't want to stay, stay there too long because I think it's kind of obvious, but we, we're always missing the message of God's love and grace in favor of the message of who's going to get theirs. And so that, I think they missed that then. So maybe one of the reasons they miss it is, is they're looking for the military Messiah. Maybe the other reason they miss it is because if you're going to be a prophet, you've got to be prophesying a bunch of bad stuff's going to happen. And Jesus comes along making God look good. And he's a God of love, although there will be some bad stuff prophesied and it'll happen. We'll see a little bit of it tonight, in fact, because there's a setup for that bad stuff happening. That's one of the ways. There's two. There's one of the ways in which Moses is accuser. That's, con that's contextually what, what they miss. But then there's this, this sort of underlying number two, this thing that I think is a foundational truth of both the Gospels and certainly the Epistles. And that's this idea that Moses gave the law. The law declares guilt. Thus, by default, Moses is an accuser. If Moses is giving you law and law declares you guilty, who's the guy declaring you guilty? Moses. And that would look something like this scripturally. John 1.17, this one we were in weeks ago. The law was given by Moses. This is one of our famous grace passages. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus. Never, ever, ever, ever forget that dichotomy. Moses brings you law. Jesus brings you grace. They don't do this. There's a very important distinction in this passage. And so if you try to marry the message of grace with the message of law, you are marrying two covenants that can't stand at the same time. You're marrying the covenant that Moses experienced, the covenant that Jesus experienced. So the law is given by Moses, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. That's one instance. Look how Paul says it, Romans 3.19. We know that what things soever the law says, it says to them who are under the law, that every mouth might be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So what's the purpose of the law, according to Paul? Paul says that it, if you give people the law, here's the end result you're going to get out of them. Every mouth is going to be stopped. All the world's going to become guilty. Why is every mouth stopped? Because you don't have any excuse. I mean, if I give you the law and go, thou shalt not, what are you going to come back with? I don't want to. That doesn't work. Well, how do you get around your guilt too? So, I mean, if, we want to, if you want to establish guilt in people, it's pretty easy to do. You don't have to even get out of the Ten Commandments. 
They've lusted. They wish they, wish they had something that didn't belong to them. They've stolen. Uh, they've lied. They've put something in front of God. I mean, we've all done it. We're all guilty. That's the whole purpose of the law is to bring you to the end of guilt and say, well, I can't do this on my own. And that's the point. And so Moses then becomes the accuser because the law stops people's mouths. It declares everybody to be guilty before, before God. And then it looks something like this. I wanted to dig back into the story. Deuteronomy 31. Watch this from Moses. I, 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 I really want to take a second and grab hold of a couple of points out of this that kind of be easy to just jump past this on our way to brighter skies in the New Testament. But there's a moment here in the Old Testament I don't want to miss. Come to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book until they were finished. For those listening and not watching, I, I realize I, I go back and listen once in a while to these and I realize I depend too much on the visual. I got a lot more audio listeners than video viewers. So for audio listeners, this is Deuteronomy 31, verses 24 to 29. I need to remember to do that more often. That Moses commanded the Levites, which bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law, put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against you. This is a, stay right here for a minute, because who, who wants to do this? Who wants to set up a witness against themselves? And Moses is saying, I want you to take this law, I want you to put it right here at the Ark of the Covenant, but it's going to witness against you because it's going to see all the bad things you do. It's going to shut your mouth before God's going to declare all of you guilty. You might think, well, let's just find somewhere else to keep it. Why, why carry it with us everywhere we go? But that's the nature of the law. It had to be there as a witness against them. Uh, next, next screen, 27. For I know your rebellion and your stiff neck. That's just a good old-fashioned way of saying that you guys are, you don't ever change your mind. Behold, while I'm yet alive with you this day, you have been rebellious against the Lord. 28. Gather to me all the elders of your tribes and your officers that I may speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to record against them. And how much more after my death? Who's talking, by the way, right now? This is Moses. And so I'm, I'm putting this in partially to show you that when Jesus says in John 5, you have Moses to accuse you, he's on good grounds. Moses is an accuser of them. Because all he has to do is look to the law and then look at their actions and go, look, your actions don't meet up with the law. So I'm accusing you. So gather to me all, all everybody so I can speak these words in their ears. I want to call heaven and earth to record against them. Heaven and earth. Did we do this last week? Those, those crossed circles. Maybe that was Sunday we talked about that a little bit. Heaven and earth crossing. And the place in the midst of that circle where those two concentric circles would be the temple for, for Israel, because heaven was not a place. This is the Western mind, by the way. Heaven's a place way out there on the other side of the galaxy that's, that's invisible. Maybe you could find it with a spaceship, but probably not because it's invisible. And it's way out there, and that's where everybody lives that dies. Earth is the place here where you got your hands and your feet. And physical people live on earth, and spiritual people live in heaven. And God's view, Old Testament view, was heaven and earth were these concentric circles and the place where they meet is the place where God sets and where does God set in the Old Testament in the temple and so the terminology for a Jew circa the time of Christ was heaven and earth when Jesus says heaven and earth shall not pass away or the law shall not pass away heaven and earth shall not pass away till all the law be fulfilled there it is what's he mean not a place out there and a place down here that temple, that's the focus. It's the seat of God on the earth. So I'm going to speak these words in your ears and call heaven and earth to record against them. That's a big statement because that's Moses saying, pay attention. The tabernacle's watching all the time. It's a cloud by day and a fire by night, but it's God and he sees everything you do. Where does the Ark of the Covenant sit in the tabernacle? Most holy place behind the back curtain. It's where God sits. In fact, God sits on the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant. So if the law is tucked into the Ark of the Covenant and heaven and earth is recording against you, he goes, how much more after I'm gone? Some of you guys are only living right now because I'm still alive. When I'm dead, this place is going to become an animal house. I mean, you guys are going to go nuts. Here's the next verse. 
For I know that after my death, you're going to utterly corrupt yourself. You're going to turn aside from the way which I've commanded you. Evil will befall you in the latter days because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. And that 29th verse is an important eschatological verse because Moses says in the latter days, things are going to get rough for you guys because you're going to sin like crazy against the law and God's going to get mad at you. And Jesus comes along and starts to minister that Israel is pushing it and that there's something going to happen to a generation of people and you're provoking through the work of your hands. And so I lay all of this out there because I want, you to, make, I want to make sure that you understand that Moses is an accuser and they knew it. So it looks a little bit like this. In order for Christ to free us, let's interpolate ourselves into this story. In order for Christ to free us from condemnation, he had to remove the weapons of the accusers. According to John 5, who was accusing Israel? Moses. What weapon does Moses have by which to accuse Israel? The law. He, puts, he has that law and he says, the law does it for me. The, the law says you guys are guilty and you're piling up this guilt and it's going to get worse after I'm dead. And he's been dead for a long, long time when Jesus comes along and goes, don't think I'm going to accuse you. You don't need me to accuse you. You already got Moses to accuse you. There's already the law working against you. The law is already accusing you. But then we come along in the new covenant and we start preaching, hey, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. But I ask, how can Christ free you from being condemned if the voice of the accuser is always in your ear? So you're always going to be feeling bad if you're listening to the accuser. So the more you feed on the performance of the law, the more the accuser has to use against you and the, the less you can be free from condemnation. So when I, I go to places and say to people, hey, Christ has freed you from Condemnation, there's no more condemnation of those that are in Christ Jesus. And people go, like, amen, praise God. And they go right back, they meet you at the door and start to tell you how bad they feel about all this stuff going on in their life or that they can never be used of God or that they don't believe they deserve favor. And I go, wait, what part did you miss about he doesn't condemn you? Yeah, I know that, but. And on the other side of that but is always an accuser because they've got junk they know about. And you go, okay. We can't properly set you free from the condemnation until we get rid of the accuser. Now, I, I, I just kind of sneak ahead. This is a little rabbit, and, and we'll, we won't get to him for a while because it's in John 8. But remember in the John 8 story of the woman caught in the act of adultery? And they bring the woman to Jesus, and they're all holding their rocks. And Jesus says, he without sin among you cast the first stone. And of course, no one throws a rock because... Moses is accusing all of them too. That's the point. It's basically Jesus going, look, if Moses hasn't accused you of anything, kill her. And no one kills her because we all have Moses to accuse us. So they drop their rocks and Jesus is doodling in the ground and he looks to the woman and it's just him and her and probably his disciples. And he says to the woman, woman, where are your accusers? And she said, there are none. And he says, then neither do I condemn thee. Catch, that, catch the order. Woman, where are your accusers? None. Then neither do I condemn thee. I can't, listen, lady, if, they're, if they don't leave, you are condemned. Because you committed adultery. I mean, Moses deems you guilty. I got to get rid of Moses if I'm going to call you not guilty. So I've got to convince these guys to drop their rocks or they're going to drop them on your skull because you're guilty. You did commit adultery. The Deuteronomy passage says you deserve to die. I have to get rid of them. If I get rid of them, I get rid of that pending sense of doom. And so... We do only half the work when we tell people, you're, no, you're not condemned. If we don't leave, let them leave knowing the accuser has been taken care of, 
then they're going to leave and believe that they are condemned. So in order for Christ to truly free you from condemnation, Christ has to completely release you from the weapons of the accuser. Let's borrow the teaching of Paul, Colossians 2. You, Colossians 2, verses 13 to 17, you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, has he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Take a look at this. This is you, pre-salvation. Before you met Jesus, you were dead in your sins. The uncircumcision of your flesh just means Gentile. Don't get trapped there too much. He raised you up with him, and what did he do? He forgave you of all of your trespasses. You were dead, and he forgave you of all your trespasses. Good place to start. Now, you've, now something's happened. Next verse. Here's what he did. He blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against you, which was contrary to us. He took it out of the way, and he nailed it to his cross. Don't think... Okay, go back a screen, would you? In verse 13, he forgave you of everything you ever did wrong. In verse 14, he takes another step. Verse 14, he blots out the handwriting of ordinances that was against you, that was contrary to you, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. 13 and 14 are not the same thing. He's not repeating himself. For years I misread this, because here's what I thought Jesus did at the cross. Forgave me of my sins by nailing my sins to his cross. He took all my bad stuff and he nailed it to the cross and moved it out of my way. No. Go back one more time. Just make sure you see it. Go look at 13. He forgave you of your trespass. He took care of your sin right here. So you done the sin. Forget the sin. sin. Done deal. Forgiven. You, oh, you want to be forgiven? Forgiven. But now what are we going to have to do? Because it's not enough for me to forgive you, he says. If I forgive you, and I don't take the accuser away, it's not gonna, it's not gonna stick, it's not gonna keep. Because you're gonna go right back out here and the accuser's gonna meet you at your car. And he's gonna go, you didn't really get what you think you got, did you? You're not as saved as you think you are. You're not forgiven. You're just, you're a loser. You're, you're gonna fail again tomorrow. You failed yesterday. You're failing right now. You don't deserve this. And you know what? He's right. Because if you're gonna keep listening to Moses, you're gonna keep failing anyway. But he's already forgiven you your trespass. He needs to do something else. So the next verse is he blots out the handwriting of ordinances. If I give you an or if the city gives you an ordinance, that's not a sin, that's a command. If they come to you with an ordinance that you can't park here anymore, that, that is an ordinance called don't park here anymore. If you park here, you're guilty. Jesus says, I need to take all the stuff that's telling you what to do and determining your value based upon your performance. He takes all the ordinances and nails them to his cross. They're against you, and he takes them out of your way. They're in your way. Why are they in your way? Why, why is the law in your way? It's not because it's not good, but it's because it, it demands a standard for your righteousness that you can't keep. And therefore, it becomes a stumbling block to you because you can't possibly walk in it. And so he nails it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly. Uh, watch this phrase, triumphing over them in... That, man, a little word can mean a whole lot. Triumphing over them in what? The action of this verse is the it. And the action of this verse was that Jesus took a list of stuff that had been handwritten that you were supposed to live up to that was in your way and he nailed it to his cross. And by nailing it to his cross, he spoiled the power of principalities and powers because he openly made fun of them by victoriously triumphing over them when he nailed that stuff to his cross. So the, what he nailed to his cross was the very weapon that the principality and power had to use against you and against me. 16, let no man therefore, when you see a therefore, find out what it's, there it is. So what is that one therefore? In light of the fact 
that you have been forgiven of your sins and had all the ordinances that were against you nailed to the cross and the principalities and the powers don't have any power and God's triumphed over them by nailing that to his cross. In that respect, therefore, why would you let anybody tell you what to eat or drink or whether or not you should worship on a holy day or whether you should observe the new moons or whether you should still keep the Sabbath, colon, all that stuff was a shadow, but the real deal is Jesus. And so what's Paul saying? I think it's kind of simple. Paul says you used to be a sinner and then you met Jesus and you received forgiveness of all of your sins, but that wasn't good enough because you knew you'd be, feel bad about the next one. And so he took all the stuff that you'd been living up to, trying to live up to and desperately failing and he nailed it to the cross. And the minute he did it, he took all the weaponry away from all of your accusers because what do they have to use against you now? They don't have anything to use against you. And he triumphed over them in it. And that's a Roman term. And the, and the triumph is when a Roman general wins a battle, he comes back into the city at the front of a procession and all of his prisoners of war walk in chains behind him. And Paul uses that phrase and says, what Jesus did at the cross is he triumphed over the forces of your accusers. And they're all trailing him into the city now. And you are part of the victory train. So why in the world would you let anybody judge you over stuff when you know who you are. Now, now notice, Paul doesn't say, don't let anybody judge you based upon your adultery committing or your murdering. And this, this does need to be brought out because sometimes what we can do is take verses like this and go, well, what Paul meant was, hey, I can do anything I want because all the obligations have been nailed to the cross. And we're going to find in a minute, Paul never meant that at all. What Paul does mean is, why would you go back and, because all of these things, holy days, new moon, Sabbath, these are religious observances by people who believe that by keeping them, they are somehow holier or more righteous than the people that don't. Paul says, don't ever fall for that lie again, because nothing makes you more righteous or more holy than the fact that you are forgiven and all the weapons the enemy's been using against you, he can't use anymore because he'd have to take them off the cross to use them. Now, here's the sad, that's all beautiful. Here's the sad part. What I see happening in the church is that we're taking our hammer and flipping it around, you know, with the little claw on the end of it, and we're unloosing all of the demands off the cross and giving them to people on Sundays. You got to do this, and you got to do this, and you got to do this, and you got to do this if you want this, and this, and this, and this. No, no, you're saved, but if you want the good stuff. And all that is is a new moon and a Sabbath day and a holy day. And you, you walk out with a whole new list of stuff to do, and a bunch of depression on why you can't do it anymore. Or you're, worn, you're so worn out that you can't even keep your eyelids open trying to, trying to work for a God who seems to be perpetually bothered by how little you're working for God. And I, I think it's time to flip that hammer back around, nail that thing back to the cross. <laughs> why would you live by, why would you let anybody judge you in who you are in Christ based on what you observe and don't observe. Now, this is not peripheral to this lesson. This is this lesson. I know it's Colossians. But you got to get rid of the accuser or you're not going to move forward in life. And it's Moses. So there's this statement. Moses stood as one of those principalities. Remember that previous verse that said principalities and powers lost their power? Moses stood as one of those principalities. We know this because Jesus called him an accuser. Good and important people can become accusers in your life if you look to them for approval and if you look to them for acceptance. They're not bad people, but you've given them an authority they don't deserve in your life. And you just dwell on that for a moment, if you would. Because they're not, it's not, Moses isn't a bad guy. Nothing wrong with Moses. Moses is God's chosen man. He's doing everything he's supposed to do. But we have taken the Moseses in our lives and we've made them into an accuser because we gave them an authority and a power over us that they were not supposed to have. And although Moses is a good guy, good and important people become accusers in your life if you look to them for approval. I've been saying this for a while in some of my meetings and that is that I think one of the the, the, the issues that a lot of New Covenant people have is they, they can't get past the ghosts of their grandfather. And what I mean by that is I'm not trying to be poetic. It, it, I, what I literally mean what I say. They can't get past the sound of that dead person in their life that told them 
whatever they told them. You know, you hear your, your pastor from when you were a kid and you think, well, if I, if he knew this about what I thought about grace, he'd roll over in his grave. And I literally see people chain themselves to misery, religious misery over the voice of someone who's no longer relevant in their life and who never should have had that place in the first place because that person was displacing the Holy Spirit in their life, telling them how to live and what to do. And, and I know for a moment want to downplay the role of fathers and the role of authoritarian figures or, or authority figures or influence, people who have influence, but let's put them in the proper perspective because that's important. Israel looked at a good God named Moses and they made him something that they could never let go of. They made him this, Exodus 18. This is, a, this is an important text that gets overlooked because this gets picked back up in the New Testament. If you miss it in the Old, you won't know what Jesus means in the New. Exodus 18, 13, it came to pass in the morning, Moses sat down to judge the people. The people stood by Moses from the morning into the evening and this became the law system of Israel. Moses sits in a chair and Israel lines up with their complaints and their issues and they walk in front of Moses and they say, Here's what's going on, who's right and who's wrong. And this goes on all the time. Can you imagine how many people? Moses is the ultimate arbiter. And, well, it, it gets exhausting. When Jesus comes along in one of the most important eschatological moments in the Bible, you've heard me say that before about Matthew. Let me repeat it. Eschatology is a study of last days. The last days that Matthew talks about is the last days that is Jewish economy. And Matthew 23, 24, 25, it doesn't, well, you start about 21, 21 to 25. Some of the most important things you're going to read in eschatology. And how Jesus sets up that 23rd chapter of Matthew is like this. See if this looks familiar. Matthew 23, verses 1 and 2. Jesus spoke to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. I don't know where the word seat is there, but it belongs. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. What's Moses' seat? Well, it's Exodus 18. What happened in Exodus 18? Moses sits down and everybody marches in front of him. And all day long, he tells them the difference in good and evil and the right and wrong and who's right and who's wrong. And he passes judgment. And Jesus comes along and says, the scribes and the Pharisees are sitting in Moses' seat and he's not complimenting them. What he's saying is, you've allowed these people to become your accusers. They sit in a chair of judgment against you all day. Now, when you get home, read the 23rd chapter of Matthew. I, I, I highly recommend you take a, a moment tonight or this week and read slowly. Start at Matthew 23, 1 and 2. Watch the Moses seat and then watch Jesus go to work on those scribes and Pharisees. Eight distinct and separate woes. Woe to the scribes and Pharisees. And a bunch of stuff in between the woes. But there's a, there's a whole chapter full of stuff, and they don't look good, ever. And then this is how it ends. Look at this. Same chapter, Matthew 23, 34. This is right near the end. Wherefore, behold, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you're going to kill and crucify. Some of them you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zacharias, the son of Berechias, whom you killed between the temple and the altar. And verily I say unto you, when's this going to happen? All these things shall come upon this generation. That's 23. We're not even, that's Matthew 23. We're not even into Matthew 24. When the disciples pull him off to the side after this and go, hey, Lord, when's this going to happen? And Jesus goes, Let me I'll tell you when it's going to happen. And then you get deep into 24 and he goes, this generation is not going to pass away until all this stuff gets fulfilled. This is the same stuff Deuteronomy said in the latter days. You're going to push it, 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 and God's going to get mad. And these bad things are going to happen. And it's going to happen after Moses is dead, but it's going to keep... It's going to still be a result of Moses because Moses is going to be your accuser. You're just going to transfer Moses over to scribes and Pharisees. And the scribes and Pharisees are going to take a place in your life. And I think we've transferred scribes and Pharisees over with other people now. And we put in the Moses seat and let them accuse until they tear us down, until they destroy us. And so it brings me to my final question tonight. What good's the law now? Can I ever use it? Should I ever use it? I get asked this a lot. 
Not so much anymore, but I remember when I first started coming into Grace, I got asked this question all the time, and I asked this question all the time. This was one of my early real mental struggles. For me, a big part of study, by the way, I don't know if anybody cares about this, but maybe you do. Somebody watching might. For me, a big part of study, when I say I'm going to study for a sermon this weekend, a huge part is thinking and working through stuff and talking out loud and asking questions and then giving answers, bad ones. And I try to give the worst possible answer I can give, followed by one that's less terrible and work my way up to what I think might be the very best possible answer I can give to that question. And then I've kind of worked the spectrum. And I found that as I'm asking those questions and I hopefully make it from really, the bad ones are easy to come up with. I'm good at this side of the ledger. The, the tough questions, the good questions are harder and they're really hard. And I don't like asking them because I don't have very good answers and, and, and my answers are over here and they're bad. And so as I'm working this spectrum, tributary shoot off. Riv, little rivers, and that's where sermons happen for me. So I go, I usually go out of thought. Let's try to solve a problem. Okay, so I'm going to go to a conference this weekend. They want me to talk about the kingdom. Let's think about an issue about the kingdom of God. Let's pose a question in our study and then spend the week working on that question. The, the scary part about that is you get to the end of the week and you haven't gotten anywhere, and now it's the conference time. <laughs> that happens. You go, okay, you might want to dig into something a little easier. Go a little softer. Throw it, throw it underhand instead of, because you're speedball by you. So I, I, I work on those and, and try to really work through them. This was one of those for years. What good's the law? I mean, if the law, if Moses is an accuser and he uses the law and the law declares everybody guilty and Christ redeemed you from the curse of the law and... The law was good until the task, uh, the law was your schoolmaster until Christ, then what good is it? Don't lie is pretty good advice. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. I can find utility in all of those. So should we be using it? I mean, is there something about the law that should be used on a practical sense? Well, here's where I stand with that. I'll give you two answers from the scriptures. Romans 10, 4. There's so much context in Romans 10 that I'm tempted to go back to 9 and read my way through the whole two chapters, but I know nobody's got that kind of time. So I will say this. Christ, Paul says this in Romans 10, 4. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Don't ever think that the words for righteousness can be removed. You go for Christ. Take them out for a second. Take the words for righteousness out. Well, what's it mean? For Christ is the end of the law to everyone that believes. It doesn't say that. But Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. So what's that mean? Well, it means that no longer does your not keeping the law make you not righteous. No longer does your keeping the law make you righteous. Why? Because Christ either died for you or he didn't die for you. And when he died, he either nailed the law, which was your accuser, he either nailed it to the cross or he didn't nail it to the cross. If he didn't nail it to the cross, then it still stands as a valid argument for your righteousness. If he did nail it to the cross, it does not, it's no longer valid. It's null and void. So the Christ, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. If you believe on Jesus, why would you think that by doing good, you could be declared good? Or that by doing bad, God would declare you bad. You shouldn't do that. The law is not for that purpose. But is the law for anything? 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 5 to 11. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. The end game of the law. Catch this. The end game. This is what God was doing all the time. What God wants from the law is charity out of a pure heart and a good conscience. In other words, 
What kind of world would you live in if people didn't lie and didn't cheat and didn't lust after stuff that doesn't belong to them and didn't steal, and these are in the Ten Commandments? Well, you'd live in a world where people showed charity because they loved you enough not to lie to you and steal from you and cheat on you and all those other things. And so the, what Paul comes up with, this, by the way, is the last two letters he ever writes is First and Second Timothy. So at the end of his ministry, he goes, you know what? I'm, I'm determined that the end of the, the whole end game for the law was that you would treat people with civility and respect. And that in doing so, you would also treat yourself with civility and respect. The problem is, you took it to be a, a ladder by which you could reach God. And it was, you can't do that. The end game for the law was charity out of a pure heart and a good conscience and faith unfeigned. That hopefully by the time you got to the end, you'd have faith unrestricted. Now in the letter to the Galatians, Paul goes, I've learned it's impossible because the law won't let you have faith unrestricted because the law gets in your way. Okay, These are cross streams. We don't have time to go down both of them, but you understand. From which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring... That's just useless talk. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. That seventh verse is interesting. Paul says there's some people that wish they could teach the law. But the problem is they don't even know what they're asking for. They don't understand what they're asking for when they ask to be a teacher of the law. He's still dealing with this in his dying day. People going back to Judaism and teaching Moses. And Moses is an accuser. Why would you go back and teach the accuser? Next verse. Eight. But we know that the law is good if, cannot emphasize how big this if is. It's a little bitty if, but it should be a massive if. We know that the law is good if you were to use it lawfully. Now that brings me to another couple of questions. What would it look like if you used the law lawfully? What would it look like if you used the law unlawfully? Good question. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. Okay, start right there. If you're right, how are you made righteous? By faith in Christ. Who doesn't the law belong to? People who've been made righteous in Christ. How would you use the law unlawfully? Use it on people who are righteous. Not use it on people who've been doing well. We're in a different covenant. You're not, you're not righteous because you do well. You're righteous because of Christ. So you want to use the law unlawfully? Use it on righteous people. Act as if they don't have the Holy Spirit inside of them telling them how to live right and put the law on the outside of them and try to tell them to live up to it. That would be an unlawful use of the law. Knowing this, the law is made for a righteous man. It's made for lawless people and disobedient. It's made for ungodly. It's made for sinners. It's made for unholy, profane, murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, men slayers, whoremongers, people that defile themselves with men. He's on a roll, by the way. They defile themselves with mankind, men, stealers, liars, perjured persons. And if there be any other thing contrary to sound doctrine, he gets to the end, he goes, he's like listing off sins. And there's this guy and this guy and this guy. And he goes, you know what? If anything at all that's just contrary to sound doctrine, they're, they're, they're all a bunch of sinners. And he goes, if there's anything contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, that's your sound doctrine, by the way. He, he defines for you sound doctrine. It's according to the glorious gospel, the blessed God, which was committed and pretentious much <laughs> committed to my trust. It's basically Paul going, you hear that grace message I preached to you? That's sound doctrine. And if they're going to, you can't put the law on top of that, it won't work. The law is for people who don't believe that. So I would answer the question. You didn't ask it. I did. Is there ever a, a time when you maybe should use the law? And my, my conclusion would be this. The law teaches people. It does teach us how to treat our neighbor, and it does treat us how to treat ourself. But the law declares you guilty because you're just not good enough to live up to it. And so I suppose if you met a man who did not believe in any sense, shape, form, or fashion that he was guilty before God and that he needed a Savior, it wouldn't be very hard to establish that guilt because Paul says in Romans 2 that if, you're, if you sin outside the law, you're judged outside of it. But if you sin inside of it, you're judged inside of it. In other words, either way, you know the right thing to do. And that's what's going to get you. And so if you needed to use the law, the only person to use it on is the guy who denies that he has a problem because he needs to know his guilt before God so that he can accept the fact that he needs to be resurrected. This is where we were Sunday. 
It's all about being resurrected into a newness of life. If you don't recognize the need to be resurrected into a newness of life, you're never going to take this step into knowing Christ. If you denied you needed a newness of life, it would be the same as denying you did anything wrong in the sight of God. The law would expose that pretty quick. Yeah, you've done some things wrong. It's pretty easy to see. So when Jesus says, you guys believe Moses, but Moses accuses you, I want you to never again, maybe you didn't have any problem with it, but never again wonder, what did Jesus mean? What Jesus meant was, if you go back to that law, Moses accused you just fine. The law will always do it. And if you go back to it now for righteousness, the accusation will still stand. The reason why you can say there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus is because he's taken your accuser and nailed it to his cross. That's why you're not condemned. It's not because you're not guilty. Let me say that again. You're not condemned, not because you're not guilty. You're not condemned because you're not accused. And you can't be accused because he took that which accuses you and nailed it to his cross. Technically, you're not guilty either because Jesus has made you not guilty. But you could, you've done enough wrong that it'd be easy to be condemned every day. And you'll probably do something wrong tomorrow. I hope not, but you probably will. You'll probably hurt yourself in one way or the other. The reality is, is that sin hurts you way more than it does your neighbor. The, the chaos you bring on yourself is far worse than what you do to your neighbor. God loved you so much, he wanted to keep you out of destroying yourself. And that's a big part of the gospel. Next week, we will start the journey into John 6, and this is the feeding of the 5,000. And there are a couple of different Old Testament motifs that Jesus is going to play off of. One will have to do with Moses. One will have to do with Elisha. Not Elijah, Elisha. And the feeding of the 5,000 will take us a while because it's the most exhaustive miracle of the Gospels. And what I mean by that is there's not another miracle that all four Gospels focus so heavily on other than the resurrection. Then they do the feeding of the 5,000. There's a reason for that, and we'll dig in. Let's say a prayer and just apply this seed into our hearts, and we'll close. Father, I thank you for tonight and the fact that we know that you have silenced the voice of our accuser. We are not denying that we do wrong and that we failed, and that's obvious. We'd have to be a liar to say that we've never failed. But we realize that we're not made righteous based upon our success and we're not made unrighteous based upon our failure. Therefore, the accuser's been silenced because his weaponry has been nailed to the cross of Christ. And that law doesn't stand in our way. Therefore, that accuser is not there. Help us to get this revelation and make it fresh. Let's get it over and over and over again as often as we need it. And I need it frequently. And I thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.